morning, we'll be in the book of Exodus chapter 20 as we continue through our series on the Ten Commandments. And um, we uh, will be on commandment three this week, um, which has to do with how we use the name of the Lord. And we'll talk more about that um, in just a moment. Now, what I want to say kind of by way is a, of reminder um, Ten Commandments isn't actually a phrase that the biblical authors use to describe what's happening in this text. Uh, what the biblical authors use is the phrase ten words, which is translated as a decalogue. And so they are imperatives in the sense of their authoritative commands that God gave to his people through Moses. But I actually really like the idea that they aren't just commandments, but they are words that have multiple layers of meaning and life to them. And so the first thing that I would say is that one way that uh, people of God have always understood what we call the Ten Commandments is as promises. That these are ten words spoken by God as prophetic promises based on who he is and what he's going to do for his people and through his people. And so think about it that, like this. Go to verse 2. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make an image for yourself in the form of anything on heaven, in heaven or on earth, beneath the earth, waters below. And then go to verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will hold anyone Guilt, not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So I want to focus on that language of you shall not. And we hear that as God saying, don't do this. But remember what we're doing here is catching up in the middle of a story where God's people for 400 years had been enslaved in Egypt and then God miraculously saves them out of slavery and then he's brought them on this journey of purification and refinement as they prepare to enter in to the promised land. And so as we said two weeks ago, it takes an instant to get, slavery, to get a person out of slavery, but it takes years to get the slavery out of a person. And so God's got them in this journey, and he is saying, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, and then hear it through these years. You will have no other gods before me. You will not make any idols for yourself. You will not misuse my name. You will keep the Sabbath. You will honor your father and mother. You will not commit murder. You will not steal, and so forth. The idea is God is saying, here is a promised vision of what life in my kingdom is going to be like. As you have been delivered from slavery and into freedom in the promised land, let me tell you some of the marks of my kingdom that I will one day bring about. As people who dwell as citizens in my kingdom, you won't murder. You won't steal. You won't lie. You won't commit adultery. You won't covet. He's describing a redeemed humanity a picture of what life was always supposed to look like, starting from the Garden of Eden. And he's saying, in my kingdom, here is what human life looks like, a life marked by flourishing, a life marked by love, a life marked by worship and harmony and beauty. In my kingdom, there will be no theft. There will be no murder. There will be no idolatry. There will, will be no immor immor immorality, right? Do you hear that? You shall not, he's saying, this is going to be your reality. Now, we understand when it comes to biblical prophecies, the foretelling of what would come to be one day, that they always have different levels of fulfillment. And so, in one hand, we, we are, we're hearing God say, as you prepare to enter into the holy land, into the promised land, that this is my invitation that you would live as representatives of the future, visitors from a foreign time thousands of years ahead of now, that you would inhabit my world now as visitors from the future that are living according to the laws of this kingdom. Now, we know Israel doesn't perfectly fulfill that. In fact, they managed to fail 
pretty impressively on pretty much every single one of these. But the idea is that there's a foretaste of the kingdom that one day will be fulfilled when Jesus returns to reconcile all things to himself. These commands are received as promises that sound like a world we all desperately want to live in. And so that's the one thing, uh, or it's one thing I like about the idea that these aren't simply commands as we hear that word, but that these are words. And so first, it's that they're prophetic promises that has God proclaiming, this is the way it's going to be in my family. And so we use that language as parents oftentimes, right? If one of our kids uh, hurts the other one or says something unkind to the other one, we'll say something like, we do not treat people that way in this family. Right? We don't say those words in this family. Now, it would appear that that's untrue, because apparently we do. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying, right? <laughs> I'm giving a vision for what it looks like to be part of this little community called the Kelly family. And this is not the kind of behavior that's congruent with this family. That's what God's doing. We will not be a family that murders, that kills, that steals, that covets, that lusts. Apparently we are, but we will not be at one point. Okay, So I love this, it's 10 promises. And then secondly, I want to remind us that these 10 words can also be understood as 10 invitations. These are words that are, again are spoken after Israel has already been delivered or saved out of slavery in Egypt. Now, we believe that that's a historical, historically true story, that Israel actually was under oppression and was delivered from Egypt, but we also understand that it's a story packed with meaning and symbolism. And all throughout the scripture, slavery becomes a metaphor for sin, for all the ways that we are ensnared, all the ways that we're trapped, all the ways that we're imprisoned by our own sin and the sins of a broken world. And the idea is that just like Moses was the one sent by God to lead his people out of Egypt, Jesus is the ultimate Moses who's sent by God to lead his people out of sin and into this new life uh, of promise and hope and love. And what we need to understand is the sequence of this story matters. God doesn't give these 10 words while his people people are still in slavery. And he doesn't say, here's 10 things, and if you can keep these 10 rules, then I will free you from slavery and save you. First, he frees them. He liberates them. He leads them out of slavery. And then he says, and now, hear these 10 words as an invitation to freedom as an invitation to learn how to live with me and with one another in a way that reflects my character to the world. So the important distinction for us is anytime it comes to these commands that we receive in the scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, whatever it is, they are not the thing that saves us. They are our response to the God who saves us. It's not obedience to these commands that got Israel out of slavery. God gets them out of slavery and then says, let me invite you to a whole new life. And so for us, we don't obey God in order to get loved. We are loved and therefore we obey. We don't obey God in order to earn grace or to earn mercy or earn favor or earn blessing. He has already saved us by grace. He has already been merciful to us. He has already blessed us. We already have favor with him. And therefore, we order our lives in humble obedience to the God who loved us first. So it's incredibly important that we understand the order of this story because we could easily get into something that looks like empty, jacked up, legalistic, pharisaical Christianity, and we don't want anything like that. And so in the end, God is saying, I want to give you a vision for life in my kingdom, dwelling as my people who bear my name and represent my character to the world. And this is a gift. This law is a gift. These promises are a gift. These invitations are a gift to keep you from falling back into slavery. God is a generous God. And so this morning, we come to the third commandment. 
Um, and by the way, I'm using a Jewish ordering of the Ten Commandments. Um, they're not ordered for us in the Scripture, and so uh, Jews and Catholics and Protestants all have their own way of ordering the, the Ten. I don't really think it matters, but I like the idea that if they're ten words, the first command is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Right? And then secondly, you shall have no other gods before me. So that's what Jer led us through last week, which kind of uh, also includes the idea of not making any graven images or worshiping idols. And then this morning, thirdly, we come to you shall not misuse uh, the name of your, of your Lord. Okay. So um, you with me so far? All right. That was a long introduction, but... Um, I hope, hope we're getting, this, getting on the same page here. Um, as we've seen throughout the Bible, um, whenever the biblical authors want to refer specifically to the God of Israel, they use a capital L and a little ord, right? Um, a lord with kind of low caps. And that is our way of saying this isn't just some random God or one of many gods, but this is the God of Israel who has revealed himself to his people. And so, Lord, just in your own Bible reading and understanding, when you see Lord, that's the covenant name of God, which we refer to as Yahweh, as Yahweh. And so, when we get to this command that you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, it's not just God in generic, but it's specifically in this exchange of vows, if you will, talking at a very personal level. God is saying, my name, Yahweh, I am. This name is one that you are to revere and to honor and to hold and carry carefully. So 6,000 times plus in the Old Testament, God is referred to as the Lord, as Yahweh. And that is a simple little thing that will actually take um, some of these obscure Old Testament texts and make them much more impactful and give us enlightenment in terms of understanding the personal, familial covenant language that we see all throughout this story. And so as we know, in the Bible, names are a really big deal. In our culture, they're not a huge deal. Most of us name our kids just something that we think sounds cool or something like that. Some of us have some meaning to our names that goes back into our family or has some sort of you know, beautiful meaning behind it. But in general, uh, our culture doesn't value names nearly as much as the, the cultures that were around at the time of the Bible. And so in the Bible, your name is a very big deal. Your name is your reputation. Now, we still have some language that harkens back to those more traditional societies when we talk about making a name for ourselves, right? Um, that's, the, that's the idea that your name is uh, intrinsically connected to your character, to your identity, to your personhood, that you can't be separated from your name. And so this is why throughout the scripture, God oftentimes, when he intervenes in a person's life in a significant way that transforms their story, he gives them a new name, doesn't he? Abraham get, or Abram gets called Abraham, and Sarai gets called Sarah, and it continues into the New Testament with Peter and some of the other apostles. God is saying, um, with your new identity, you will be given a new name. And so when we talk about the name of God, which, man, if you pay attention, all throughout the scriptures is a, is a huge theme that the writers of the scriptures, especially in the Psalms, are praising the name of the Lord, crying out upon the name of the Lord. We're saying it's not just his title that would show up on his driver's license, but his name is his character. His name is packed full with everything that he is. We, when we call upon his name, we're calling upon all those attributes that God has showed of himself, his grace, his mercy, his justice, his truth, his faithfulness. The name of the Lord is the junk drawer term for all that God is. And so in the Bible, in particular, in this covenant in Exodus 20, God's name is, is a very, very big deal. Now, here's what's interesting. Um, when he says that there's different translations, but I'm in the NIV, he says in verse 7, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses 
his name. So how, whatever it is, however we translate some of those smaller words, the clear idea is that God's name is a very big deal to him, and it should be a very big deal to his people. And what's fascinating is that the name of God isn't only how we refer to and relate to Yahweh, but it actually is how he refers to and relates to us as his people. Now think about a couple of these places in the Old Testament. Second Chronicles, uh, verse 7. He says, If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will hear their, heal their land. What an interesting thing. Called by my name. God refers to his people and relates to his people, not with their name, but with his name. And so there's this emerging picture that the name of God also becomes the name of his people. Think about Isaiah chapter 43 in verse 5. He says, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, Give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And so now it's like this circle of those that bear the name of God begins to expand. And it, it starts with this covenant people of Israel. But now he's saying there's this whole spectrum of cross humanity, those made in my image and likeness who bear my image. He says, they are called by my name. And finally, another super obscure reference in the Minor Prophets, Amos chapter 9. God says, I will restore David's fallen shelter, meaning the kingdom of God that was uh, uh, erected underneath David's kingship. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it and you, and as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declared the Lord, who will do these things. Just by, real quick, Edom, if you don't know, this is Israel's arch enemies. These are the people that hated the Israelites, that hated Yahweh, hated the name of the Lord. And God, in his grace, in his generosity, in his faithfulness, says that even that which is left of Edom and all the other nations that oppose us will bear my name. Paul uses this same passage from Amos in the book of Acts chapter 15 when he is making the argument that the community of the church of Jesus should be the most diverse community in the world. That we should not just limit our gathering and our fellowship to those of the same culture and same color but that this thing should be blown wide open so that people of all nations could be one in Christ under the name of Yahweh. And so here's the point. In other translations of this verse in Exodus 20, and probably the kind of the version that most of us had heard or memorized, instead of using the, misusing the name of the Lord, how is this command typically recited? You shall not take, take, the name of the Lord in vain. And I actually think that's a little bit of a better version, although it takes some unpacking to really understand. What does it mean to take the name of the Lord? We'll get to in vain in a minute. But he's saying God is giving us his name. God has invited us into his very life. God has given himself to us in such a way that we now would be those who are called by his name. And so the idea is that we are to take the name of the Lord. To take means to carry, to assume, to lift, to bear, to take it upon yourself. So to take the name of the Lord in vain has much more to do with has, is, has way more to do than just saying his name. We are invited or even commanded to take 
the Lord's name as our own. Now we have a simple picture of this. 14 years ago when Jen and I stood on the altar at First Baptist Church in Corvallis, Oregon, and we exchanged covenant vows and um, committed ourselves to love one another for the rest of our lives, richer, poorer, sickness, health, all that kind of stuff. Um, At the end of that ceremony, Jen chose to take my name. So she is no longer Jennifer Kirkbride, but she has now become Jennifer Kelly. And a lot of people do that in our culture. And you don't have to if you don't want to. I respect the hyphen, if that's your deal, whatever. But it is a picture of Jen, me offering, I'm not just sharing um, a certain limited part of my life with you, but Jen, I'm inviting you into my whole life that the two of us are going to become one. And so my name now becomes your name. So I think it's actually just a really simple way of understanding this language that Jen takes my name and God says, I want you to take my name too, to be called by my name, that we would be known as one. So what's interesting then is that there comes a responsibility with taking the name of another doesn't there? That all of a sudden, if somebody else is going to take my name upon themselves, then there's a certain responsibility that comes with upholding that name, maintaining whatever dignity or respect or value that name represents. Thankfully, Jen has done a much better job with my name than I ever did. And has, <laughs> it's turned out to work really well for me uh, that she represents my name to the world instead of just me. So um, we all marry up, don't we? So it's a pretty, pretty good deal that way. But think about it then of saying if we are going to be those people that represent God to the world, represent his character, represent his name to the world, then he says, don't take it in vain. Take the name of the Lord as your own, but don't take it lightly as vanity, as weightless or as meaningless, as if it weren't a big deal. Don't carry around the name of the Lord as if it doesn't really matter, if it isn't a huge thing. Don't take that name casually, but wrestle with the implications that the God who created the universe and unleashed this plan of redemption through his son has now called us by his name and invited us to share in his life and his identity. So do take his name, but don't take it lightly. Now I think there's all different ways that we can do this without even realizing it. The first is, and probably the application of this command that you learned in Sunday school, is what? Don't curse, right? Don't use the name of God as a curse word, right? Um, I actually still think that's a pretty good application, right? (laughs) I think as followers of Jesus, we would do well to keep thinking uh, about this command or invitation or promise in those terms and not to utter references to God or to Jesus or whatever as uh, careless curse words. But I think there's way more going on than that. So first, that is a good application. Don't use his name as a curse word. But secondly, I think some of us fall into this trap by minimizing the name of the Lord that's been given to us. I remember a few years ago, I was at a gathering for faith leaders. And there were, I don't know, maybe 50 people in the room that had been there, that had been invited to be there at this kind of strategic, kind of citywide um, initiative. And uh, you go around the room and do introductions at the beginning, and each person is like, oh, I'm the executive director and the founder of this global nonprofit, or I'm, you know, the executive pastor of this big church. And you're kind of, everybody's going around and sharing their important Christian titles. And I remember uh, one dude that was sitting there in the circle, and when it got to him, uh, he says his name, and he goes, and I'm just a Christian. Right? Like he wasn't a pastor or a missionary or an executive of anything. He was just in the room because he cared about the thing that we're talking about. And he goes, I'm just a Christian. Um, and 
what I said to myself quietly is, dude, don't say just. You're not just a Christian. Just to say, I am a Christian is an incredible statement of identity that I am one who is included in the life of God, who's united with Christ and filled with the Spirit. I am one who has been forgiven and saved and redeemed and part of the story that God's writing in the world. I am one who's been called by God and, and chosen to represent him to the nations, to live as a visitor from the future, an embodiment of this incredible kingdom that will never end. You're not just a Christian. Don't minimize the name of Jesus. And for some of us, we have this perception that my work or my life isn't as valuable within the kingdom because I don't work for a church or for an, a nonprofit or a justice organization or I'm not a pastor or whatever. I'm just a barista. I'm just a teacher. I'm just a coach. I'm just an architect um, who happens to be a Christian. The idea is you've been given the name of Christ. And you've been invited to take his name, to carry his name. So don't do it in vain. Don't downplay the fact that your identity, first and foremost, isn't your job description or your title or how much you make or how many reports you have. Your identity is an adopted and redeemed daughter or son of God. That's a big deal. So we don't curse, we don't minimize the name of God. Thirdly, there's uh, all kinds of ways that we can take the name of the Lord in vain or misuse it through misrepresenting God. So how many of you have had your identity stolen at some point? Has that ever happened to you? A few of us. It's a super annoying thing. Sometimes it's somebody that gets a hold of your credit card and goes around buying things. Sometimes somebody hacks in to one of your accounts and they start sending stuff out in your name. I used to remember MySpace. Ask your parents about MySpace. I was on MySpace at one point and uh, somebody hacked in, stole my identity and started sending uh, super inappropriate content to all, all the people in my church from me. Um, it's a really discouraging thing. Um, here's the, the idea that it's possible to misuse the name in a way that looks something like identity theft. That when somebody steals our identity, they're going around saying things and doing things that we would never do. Buying things that we would never buy, but they're doing it in our name. And so one of the ways that God warns us in handling his name is don't use my name to say things and do things that don't represent my character. Now, the applications of this are immense, right? We can think about the history even of our own nation, we can think about the political climate of today. And for all of those things that are said and done in the name of God, Jesus, the Bible, Christianity, that look nothing like him. When we use the name of God to justify oppression or injustice or genocide or violence, that is exactly what he's saying. I am a God of love, compassion, mercy, forgiveness, justice. So don't go around doing things in my name that I would never do. But we do this on a regular basis down at the lower levels as well, right? And in some churches, there's a culture or a climate that looks like what we might have to call spiritual abuse where those who are in spiritual authority or leadership over others use the name of God to justify their mistreatment of, of those that have been entrusted to their care. God told me this. God told me that you need to do that, right? I hope you, not many of us have experienced this, but I know a lot of you have and have had work through spiritual abuse issues, and they're very real, and they're very cutting, and they stem back to this command. That in our wickedness and in our sin, we assume the name of God, Jesus, the Bible, Christianity, as a means of making a name for ourselves instead of carrying his name 
in the way that he's entrusted us. So don't curse, don't misrepresent, don't minimize the name of God. And finally, I would say this. One of the ways that I think we are most prone to take the name of God lightly is through pledging hollow allegiance to Christ and to his kingdom. I want to be careful with this one because I know we are all people in process, people being formed. But to be honest, Sunday gatherings like this are one of the places where we actually set ourselves up to do this. That we stand and we sing these epic truths about who God is and who he's revealed himself to be through scripture. We declare his holiness. We pledge our faithfulness and our honor and our obedience to him in songs and in prayers. And then we walk out the door without looking or living any differently at all. Now, the reason I want to tread lightly there is because part of our understanding of worship and of prayer is that it is formational. That we don't have to wait until there's something that we feel is true, that we are experiencing in order to verbalize it, but we believe that by singing these songs and by saying these prayers, by confessing our sins and pledging our love to God and to the world that he loves, that the words we speak, the prayers we pray, the songs we sing are shaping us from the inside out. But if there is absolutely no vision, no hunger, no commitment on our part to embody the words that we're singing and to live out the prayers that we're praying, then I think it all knocks pretty hollow that we're simply going through the motions, saying the words, singing the songs, praying the prayers, but having a life that's totally untransformed by any of it. And so as we sing and as we pray, as we declare the good news about what God is like and who God is, we want that to be an opportunity for the Spirit to form Jesus in us more fully because we've got a long ways to go. But it starts with this commitment that we are here to be changed. We are here to have all of our other allegiances challenged. We are here to have all of our other idols burned down and exposed for the stupid things they are. We are here to catch a vision for a life that would require us to leave our sin, to leave our selfishness, to leave our idolatry, and to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Let's not take the name of the Lord lightly. Let's not view our faith as just one small part of our life or of our identity. Let's not assume that the idea that we're Christians is just one of the many things that's true about us. And let's not treat Jesus as if he were just another spiritual counselor or guru. Um, Our conviction is that the church of Jesus should be the one place in all of creation where the lordship of Christ is unopposed. And we come here first and foremost every week to pledge our allegiance, love, loyalty, faithfulness, and obedience to him and to him alone as those who have already been loved blessed, saved, forgiven forever. And the idea is that if there were a community that were living that way, taking this name seriously, that that community would look so different than the world around it, that people would see, people would notice, people would be curious, and whether they realized it or not, they would be getting a picture of the character of our God. So Antioch, let's take the name. Let's carry it as those who are called and chosen and saved to love God and love his world. Will you stand with me?
Father, my dream is that as a church community, you would find in us a hospitable bride. As those who have taken your name, that you would find in us a community that's hungry and expectant of your life and your power and your presence. That we would be a people where you would come and dwell and find a home. And that we could be your people in this world, whatever that looks like from this day forward. And so we thank you that you have saved us, you have delivered us, you have forgiven us, and are making us new. Lord, don't let us take your name lightly. We thank you for this table that you invite us to, to come and to receive life from you again, to meet with you, to hear from you, to find new grace and mercy awaiting. Lord, come and meet us here in this place. Spirit, move amongst our hearts. Raise the dead in us. In Jesus' name.